If you have questions about digital photography, you've come to the right place. Welcome to Photo Focus. Here's your host, Scott Bourne. Thanks for tuning in to the Photo Focus podcast. So glad that you could join us. We're here on the 5th, the 15th, and the 25th of every month. Joining us today, he is a special guest, Richard Harrington. Thanks for coming on the show, Rich. Thanks for having me, Scott. It's always good to be here. Rich, of course, has been on the show before. He's an amazing photographer and teacher of anything that has to do with uh, any of the software programs that go with photography, etc., and especially uh, good at video and photography and that merger. And the the book from Still to Motion, which I was pleased to be a, a small part of, still going strong, isn't it, Rich? Yeah, we uh, we just did a, a special companion book on Final Cut Pro 10, and we're working on another one on Premiere Pro to help the photographers get over that hurdle about how to edit. But yeah, the book's still going strong. They're talking about doing a new edition next year at some point. And uh, it's just great to see so many people getting into photography and video merging together. It's just such a natural collision. And I'm hearing from so many photographers who are having fun again and slash many of them making more money. So both of those are great things to see that people are reinvigorated about their jobs and in a tough economy doing better. Well, I think unless you're in the Taliban, having fun and making more money is a good thing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, we're going to, uh, we, in our new format of the show, we, we, we have a little bit of discussion and then we do questions. We're going we're gonna to rip a little bit on tech today. Yeah, it's it's exciting where it's going. I mean, we've had announcements of a bunch of new cameras lately from you know from all the big players, and uh, I know recently you got your hands on a, a brand new camera technology. So I mean, I think that's really cool where that's going. And uh, if uh, Adobe's recent communications are to believe, you know, software is just around the corner. We just we got a whole bunch of new stuff coming out, so it's going to be a uh, it's going to be an expensive spring for a lot of us, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you what, it was like a there were a cornucopia of announcements, hardware, software, etc., over the last couple of months, and especially the last couple of weeks because of CES. I was going to say, and that's in your backyard, so you probably got a firsthand view of a cool few cool things. Well, you know what's really great about being here in Las Vegas during CES? Casinos and showgirls. No. Um, <laughs> the fact that everybody who w came to the show that's been here for years knows the secret is to get off the strip as quickly and often as you can. So I had literally scheduled nine meetings right here in my studio. <laughs> I never actually went to the show floor. It was great. The tech just came to you. That's Everybody even, that's came even to me. Yeah. So I had meetings with everybody right here in the studio. I didn't even have to get in my car. Um, and, and one of the best meetings – We'll just get right to it. Was with the folks from Lytro. This is perhaps the most misunderstood technology in the world. I can. Well, tell that's you. easy when when so few people like except you and like three others have actually <laughs> held it. I mean, well, and and the I, thing, I've already paid for it. It just hasn't come yet. The thing is, here's what I love about the internet. There are like thousands of Lytro experts out there who have never seen the camera, never touched the camera, never seen an image from the camera, but. They do know a guy named Dave who had a sister named Sally who used to date a guy named Tom who's friends with the postman who delivered a magazine at the Barnes & Noble about it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, I, I think it's uh, it, it's just one of those texts that, you know, is, is going to change things. And, I mean, fortunately, they've been very forthcoming on their site with a lot of details. But, you know, uh, you and I both know the last thing people on the Internet like to do is actually read other people's stuff. Oh, so my God. It's much mean, easier to guess. You mean deal with facts? Come on. I'd rather just have opinions. Uh, here's the thing. Everything you think you know about this camera, you don't. It's as simple as that. Um, the whole thing that everybody's talking about and the demo that's cool is the impost processing focus. But the the way that's talked about is people think, oh, well, that means – there won't be any need for a photographer. It'll just be, you know, anybody can focus later, and this is horrible, and it's just not that at all. I'm going to tell you straight up right now, if anything, this camera will be will require you, Rich, to be a better photographer than you already are. Well, it looks to me just, I mean, and, and again, I'm going to come out with an assumption, although I've, I've, I've researched it enough to give them my actual dollars, which means I did look at it because I'm a little stingy. Um, it looks to me like there's not that many controls on the device. So There are two buttons. 
Okay, so you, you kind of actually probably have to think. If there's only two <laughs> buttons, you usually have to think. It's kind of like the iPhone. It's not that simple of a device. There's a lot of things, you know, there's only two buttons on the iPhone, three buttons. So, you know, tell me about it. It's not and, like and it's actually, got a little I think one of the buttons is redundant. So, you, there's well, a, Apple has a patent on one button devices, you know. Okay, that might be why. Uh, there's a button to turn it on and off, and there's a shutter button, but the shutter button also turns it on. That sounds redundant. Yeah. <laughs> and there are no other controls on the camera with the exception of there's this touch-sensitive barrier on top of the camera. You simply roll your finger across it to zoom in and out. So it, is it like a trackpad sort of thing? Or? Yeah, it's sort of like a trackpad, although you can't tell. I mean, it's built right into the camera body. Okay. There's and no I, apparent – I mean, looking at it, it'd be like one of those science fiction movies where you're looking at the puzzle and you don't know where you stick your fingers in to cause the wall to open. Oh, okay. Looking and, at it, you would never know. And what's the focal range on the camera? You know, does it – I mean, I, that's, I don't know if that's the correct term for the way yeah, they're doing here's it. Here's the thing. That's where we, we – right now, we got to just stop all that conversation. <laughs> we really do. Okay. This isn't about focal range. It's not about apertures. It's not about shutter speeds. You really, you, you just kind of got to stop thinking like that. Let's let's sort of back up. I, I'll just tell you. For do you our, just meditate with the camera? You meditate. You, you be the camera. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing, Rich. Let's just talk about it from this perspective. This will help you understand. Here's what I saw with my own two eyes. Demonstrated in my studio in front of me. I saw a time lapse that was made with this camera. So you're probably thinking, oh, cool, it does time lapse. And so is our audience because they like time lapse. And yeah, it does time lapse. Uh, that won't be, that feature will not be turned on in the first iteration of the software, but it is there. Now, here's where it gets interesting. So who do I pay to turn it on? That's what I want to know. We'll talk off mic and I'll <laughs> fix you up on it. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Here's what's really cool. Now, this is where you've just got to sit down and grab something because it's going to cause vestibular interference for you. Are you ready? I saw the focused shift during the time lapse as well. Wow. So we're talking about time lapse with the usual time lapse kind of stuff. Right. You, know, you see stuff moving. And during the time lapse, the focus point was moving around down the line with the time. In an attractive way, not an unattractive way. In an way. extremely attractive way. The demo I saw was a series of lights or lanterns or something coming on with numbers on them, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so as the time lapse moved, you'd see the numbers come on, but you'd see the focus point shift to the light that was coming on during that's the cool. time lapse. Now, that's very cool. Do, just, you, do just, they program it in advance? or It's just a script. Huh. Now, now let your let your brain brain bake on that for a minute. Script computers scary. No, fear. It's, it's not it's, it's not real <laughs> tough. But I can tell you that if you think about the ramifications of that, Rich, being able to move things like nodal points and focus points in post in a time lapse, now you're cooking with gas. Oh, so this the t so. In other words, you didn't have to pre-program that with the script. Negative. After the fact, you could tweak it. Yeah. Oh, I can handle that. That's software. I'm good. It's all software. <laughs> so basically, you know, this is just a little... Software makes me a better photographer all the time. It's a little thing that looks like a kaleidoscope. You put it up to your face and there's a little LCD and you take the picture. But the thing I'm trying to get everybody to understand is this is a, this is a consumer camera. I mean, this first iteration is not aimed at you know, the the Joe McNally's of the world. But we, we've seen that sort of thing time and time again, Scott. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the first cameras that had video, like everyone was thinking about DSLRs and video and the 5D Mark II. I mean, it started on the D90. And even before that, I had point a Leica, shoot. a Leica point and shoot that had it. So, yeah. I mean, you know, that shot raw and shot video. And I love that little camera, the Deluxe 2, I think it was. So, I mean, you know, let's just be honest. In today's economy and the way things are, it's got to start with the consumers. Let the company get some cash in their pockets, get vested, get some mind share. But well, I just will say, I will say this without divulging too many details. The very last thing that Lytro is worried about today is cash in their pocket. They are well, well funded, my friend. <laughs> we should have the problems Lytro does with cash. Um, it's a whole bunch of money sitting in the bank. Um, they're not. Well, as I say, they've, they've they've had my check for months now. So well, and they've had. A I'm, much I'm hoping those cameras check. actually ship. They've had a much bigger check from the fellows down on Sand Hill Road for a long time. 
they they were oversubscribed in their Series A round in about a half a minute. So um, they're not going anywhere. But this technology, what you're going to see in the Lytro camera, is basically proof of concept, Rich. That's it. It's proof of concept. It's to get you thinking about it. And here's where it's going to be very exciting. In version 3, it's going to be in cameras that we use, you know, the kind of cameras that we're serious about. <laughs> And maybe as soon as version 2, it's going to be in video. Now, let me tell you, that's where I actually see a very strong application of this. Because what's the hardest thing in the world to do with a video DSLR? Focus. Focus. Followed by expose. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it be great to be able to say, oh, well, we'll just go ahead and turn on the Lytro button inside the video camera and we'll get to focus later. Oh, that would be awesome, especially since, you know, that's those that type of sensor seems to be well suited for those resolutions. So yeah, that would be a that would be a game changer because, you know, everybody focus is hard for a lot of folks. I think most photographers, most being a, a broad sense, not the ones that consider themselves in the top three percent, probably don't realize how often they never leave one of the priority modes on their camera. And and if you're not <laughs> shooting manual, it's like you know, either you never learned or, you know, it's like you, you grew dependent on it. I mean, at this point, and I know you'll laugh at me, Mr. Race Car Driver, I can't drive stick to save my life. You know? <laughs> well, I learned okay. We're moving it. everything to paddle shifters, Rich. You'll be fine. Oh, well, good, good. Um, yeah, I remember you're driving 35 miles an hour behind me on the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. <laughs> but in your defense, you were in a rental Tahoe. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it, with six people, it was a little bit big and wobbly. Yeah. <laughs> And when you saw the 19-degree bank, though, I bet you were thinking, oh, wow, this is not like home. Uh, at first, I laughed. And then my business partner says to me, so whose insurance is this vehicle on? <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you turned into a little dot in my rearview mirror. Anyway, the, the, uh, the whole thing here that I'm excited about is how this tech will get wrapped into our future products. That's the reason to buy the camera now is to get used to the tech, to be thinking differently. And uh, let's just start right off the bat. You know, you know how you think about things when you get your DSLR and you go to take a picture? You think a lot about focus, right? Yep. So you know what you got to think about when you're using a Lytro? Out of focus. Out of focus. You literally can't make this camera work unless something's out of focus. Okay. You, but I'm just going to say that again. The emphasis in a traditional still camera is to get something in focus. The emphasis in the Lytro is to get something out of focus. So we're not doing like Bob Guccione Vaseline on the lens to do that. No, no. This is this is how the tech works. The lens in the basic camera is f2. That's it. It's an f2 lens to help force us into a shallow depth of field so that something will be out of focus. And then I assume with that fast, it's, it's, this is pretty good in low light because there sure as heck didn't look to be any flash technology on that camera either. No, no. Yeah, yeah it's fine in low light. But keep in mind, it's, this camera's real platform is designed to make images that will be interacted with on the Internet, which is the other thing that's weird about this. Yeah, it'll make a 5x7 print. looks great. That's not what it's for, though. <laughs> What it's for is to click a button, send it to Facebook, and then have your friends play with the focus point. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, it's very bizarre. It's it, let me tell you, the, everything you think you know about it and photography in general, you got to stop and say, "Whoa, wait a minute, that's hard to think about." And you know, there'll be the typical people that just aren't able to do any critical thinking, or are too lazy to, or don't care to, and they'll just forget about it. But I'm, I'm already have thoughts of ganging multiple ones of these together for a panorama that you can change the focus point in. But I'll, oh we'll no, have no to you don't. You don't even really. I mean, it goes. It, 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 listen, here's the cool thing. Now, the way they're going to do this is, so you're going to have your interactive Lytro picture. Let's say that you've uploaded to your Facebook page. In version two of the software, they're going to turn on maybe this uh, ability to do the time lapse, and they're going to turn on a couple of other little things that I know that they can already do. <laughs> Oh, so let me let me step back for a second, if I can ask this, and and you you may not be able to answer this question, but are we talking version two of a camera or version two of a software package? I don't know the answer to that question, but it could be either. Okay. I mean, here's the great thing: the software is independent of the camera, and just That's like good. just like Adobe updates camera raw. Yeah. These guys will be updating their software. Now, here's where it gets interesting, Rich. Let's say you've taken a picture with your new Lytro when it ships in March, they hope, and you post it to your Facebook page. And then let's say six months from now, version two of the software comes out. Without you having had to do a thing, 
whatever new features they turned on in version two are now embedded in that picture that you posted from six months before. So this is like the Skynet approach. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so let's say that they turn on the ability to shift the nodal point in version two. Right. Which, by the way, I saw him do it. That's sweet. Um, that it'll just be there in, in, in your picture. Like they took a <laughs> – this is really hard to even talk about because I was sitting there looking at it and I still can't believe it. But So, the, so these guys obviously uh, don't really care for status quo or oh, no. traditional models of, oh, you want that? Give us more money. You want that? Give no, us no, more no, money. No, no, no. By the way, the camera just natively does 3D just so you know. <laughs> just thought I'd throw that out there. Could it make me coffee in the morning and drive me to work? Because <laughs> yeah, then yeah. I'll buy two. <laughs> There's only one lens, and yet it does all the 3D modes, every single one of them. Wow. Uh, that's just built in. Uh, but then they showed me a demo where they took a picture of something, and they clicked Did they, a- did they take you to Area 51 to show you the spaceship <laughs> that crashed that they took this out of? I don't know. Then they took me to a place where they showed me, like – Take a look at this picture. Now, what would happen if you took two steps to the left? There it is. They actually shifted the whole picture and revealed part of the picture that wasn't there in the first iteration. That's pretty cool. So, I mean, it's not like a crop. It, like, it physically no, no, no. You move. Apart. Okay. Yeah. So this this has a lot of interesting ramifications then where you know certain panoramics were going before with like quick time VR tours. We could potentially see a resurgence for things like real estate photography or – Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, interactive tours where the person could truly get submersive and start looking around. Well, well, you really know. I'll tell you what this is. This is a foothold on holography. Nice. This is, in fact, they said they've been working on holographic projectors for this. So, this oh, sweet. Th- this is this is the <laughs> I, holodeck. I have a holodeck in my lifetime, That's dude. You're awesome. going to see the holodeck in your lifetime. <laughs> Now, uh, th- here's what the ramifications people are. People think basically. Facebook is like crack. Yeah, trust me. <laughs> I'm going to be busy. I've got an appointment for the next six months on the holodeck. <laughs> me and Mario Andretti are going to race. Uh, here's the thing. Th- this stuff will really take off after the usual naysayers and trolls and people that hate everything in life attack it. Then it gets in the hands of real artists Lytro predicts that it will do things that even they hadn't conceived of because real artists will come up with ways to use this stuff that will blow everybody's mind. Well, absolutely. I mean, this just looks like to be one of those technologies that is groundbreaking and will open up opportunities for people to try new mediums. I mean, I, it, it looks really cool. I can't wait to people start, you know, I'm hoping that they'll have like an API to a certain extent to allow other people to develop stuff into the software because this, this just has the potential to change imaging. Well, it, it, they are going to open up an API. They said they don't want to be in that business. So they're going to have APIs and SDKs and all that kind of stuff out there. I mean, we're very early days in this, Rich. I, I mean, it, it's it's going to be a couple of years before you really understand what this means. But in terms of getting used to shooting with this new methodology, I mean, you really have to think about how you're going to shoot. This is why I say the photographer is going to be need to be even more skilled because instead of thinking depth of field you got to think plane of field like like near middle and far you got to think about i need foreground and background objects to make this work because composition yeah you you have to think about like the way you here's people i've said this in my article that i wrote about this if you've already done any 3d work then you're, you're ahead of everybody on this. I was going to say, that's what I was just thinking yeah. about. Like when I cut up photos into 3D space or I'm working in 3D animation, it's like foreground, yeah. mid-ground, background. Yeah, you, like you're thinking of like the, that commercial we've all seen from HTC where the guy's playing ping pong and the ball comes straight at him. Yeah. Uh, you know, the tricks that we see in the traditional 3D movies. That's what you're going to want to think about as a photographer. You're going to want to think about – Something like, like like the picture that I I posted a picture on Google Plus that was taken from the Lytro a picture of me holding my uh, little uh, the, the very nice little statue that Scott Kelby gave us when we spoke at Photoshop World the little glass thing you know little I didn't get one of those oh sorry. <laughs> no I'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, um, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, it, it, it's a little award thing, and, and it's got nap written on it. And they put that in front of my face, right? 
And then they took the picture. And then in post, you can tap on that thing to make that in focus, or you can tap on my face behind it to make it in focus. Well, I, I mean, I, the, the thing that I'm laughing about this, too, because you said it's an F2 lens. I, I know so many photographers who you know don't have lenses that go faster than four or five. I don't think they are going to realize what that's like, having that sort of control. That's yeah. really pretty. But now here's the thing that's going to screw everybody up. They're going to think, oh, well, F2, I can't get enough depth of field. Stop that. Stop thinking like that. Because with this camera, you can hit one button and everything in the picture is in focus. Everything. Right. It's, so it's, it's, it just stacks those, sort of like stacking those together, combining. Yeah. 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 It's like you had F64, but you didn't. Right. No, that's that's pretty amazing. I mean, and I uh, are they um, – I guess I'm just being preemptive here. Is this something they're going to keep or, or is this something that's going to start ending up in other manufacturers' cameras? I mean, I know we saw that some people were doing more mirrorless cameras now and, you know, we're, we're, there seems to be some shift going on in the traditional camera realm, although – uh, point and clicks, new point and clicks coming out, although I'm not sure how long those are going to last. It, it seems like the market is sort of up for a shakedown. Well, I, I, you know, I can't speak for them, and I don't, I don't know what all their plans are. They intimated to me that they discussed, and I know they discussed with several manufacturers licensing this technology as far back as six years ago when it first was invented. But I think that they got to the impression that you know they were concerned that if they licensed it to the big camera manufacturers, they would just promptly shelve it. Right and figure it out later, and they wanted pull to, a Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, they wanted to get it to the market, so they're they're gonna they're gonna bring it to the market, and then when the market catches up, I think the rest of the companies will license it, or at least the SDK or API or whatever they release. But I, I, I think there's major major application of this in the video space. Oh yeah, no, this is. I mean, that just is going to be amazing because you know so many people after the fact are struggling with oh my subject moved a little bit, they fell out of focus. I mean. Looking at the software demo, the ability in post to just click right between your subject's eyes and lock that focus in, yep. that's going to be awesome. <laughs> well, let's yeah. uh, let's also just talk about uh, Lightroom 4 beta came out. Yep. And as, uh, as you already knew, but you couldn't talk about, and now the rest of the world knows, there's a much larger emphasis on video. It seems like Adobe and uh, other companies are starting to get that video actually matters. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, there's, there's stuff I know that's coming that I, that I can't comment on, but it, it's nice to see so many people embrace that. I mean, it, it's pretty cool where they're taking it, and uh, I'm glad that they did a public beta. You know, just, you know, Adobe always does that. The labs page is so awesome with, with all the features that they're putting in there. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty good what they're what they're doing. I mean, it's uh it's exciting. You know, the ability to, you know, keep your video library organized. We kind of had that before, but now being able to do color processing and to to trim things a bit and then publish right out of there, you know, I think this is exciting. I mean, for, you know, I mean, it's just Facebook and Flickr. I'm a little surprised they didn't put Vimeo in yet, although maybe that's on the queue, but it's nice to see that you know, they're sharing features in there because I think that always invigorates people to get more involved once they start getting feedback. So as somebody that's got experience with Aperture, yeah, how would you rate the current Aperture video tools with the current Lightroom 4 beta video tools? <laughs> that's tough. They, um, they seem pretty close. Um, you know, I mean, the... <sighs> Looking at it, the I think you have a little bit more color correction controls to to video in Aperture than you really do. I'm sorry, in Lightroom than you really do in Aperture. You've got um, better um, publishing tools in Aperture, but you know that's pretty simple. Uh, yeah, the you know Would you training say it's a push? in it. It's pretty. It's pretty dang close. I mean, you know, it's like it's nice that you can do the white balance and the black clipping and saturation and vibrance. You can't really do that much to video and aperture. So I think they right. actually may have a slight lead there okay. in, in that they're giving you some more um, more color correction type things. But I think that aperture has more publishing options, and I still think aperture has much better slideshows than than Lightroom. So the I'm assuming that the color correction stuff is tapping into Premiere Pro. 
No, it, it's um, – I think – I mean the, the same core technology I think. That's what I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean what Adobe calls that Mercury Engine technology that they've been using is, is sort of a combination of CUDA, um, which is currently tied to NVIDIA technology. But they're opening that up and they've also been um, tying stuff in – don't break my non-disclosure agreement. Um, there's been lots of stuff going on under the hood with you know, with how video is processed. And so people on modern computers with 64-bit OSs, video is no longer the pain that it used to be. Uh, so I think we're going to see people, you know, I mean, you, you've been able to open up video in Photoshop for a while. But, you know, this is a nice hint with Lightroom 4 how you're not going to feel a big pain difference between working on a photo and working on a video. And photographers are going to be able to work with video in the ways that they want to work with video, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's all kinds of exciting stuff coming down the road. We're going to see video play a much more prominent role in every post-processing software package that you can buy from here on out. And that will be important to our audience, particularly if they like to do time lapses. But moreover, I think with the addition of these technologies like Lytro, we're going to just start redefining the entire space where we exhibit photography and, and imagery in general. It, it, it's not going to be a matter of the web or print. It's going to be a, a matter of pretty much everywhere. Well, there's, I think there's yeah, I mean, going to be imagery everywhere. I think one of the things that continues to amaze me and that um, a lot of photographers are losing track of, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love printing and I love printing on canvas and printing on metal and, and beautiful things that are mounted. But if you are going out into retail environments, hotels, you know, museums, you name it, public spaces, electronic signage is king. Yeah. And it's amazing with that. I mean, you know, we're not going to be that far away from people having apps on their phones so they can interact directly with electronic signage, you know, move through a Lytro picture or a virtual tour. You're down in the lobby of a hotel and you're looking for a restaurant and you want to see photos of it and you can move around and look at it, you know, with technology like that. I mean, we're going to get to this place where people just want to manipulate it. Microsoft's PhotoSynth is a nice tip to that. I, I think, you know, our audience who's into making, in many cases, bigger pictures, you know, panoramics, time lapse, that show Passage of Time, uh, if you are a person interested in high quality imagery and you're also interested in just showing more, which is really what we, our three areas of focus do, uh -huh. I, I think it's exciting times. You know, people are, we're, we're moving beyond the world of getting prints at Walgreens, which is, you know, sort of where people have been stuck for years of, you know, prints. Um, yeah, I talk to younger photographers, and the concept of getting their work printed seems so foreign to them. Yeah. Well, you can still make prints even from the Lytro camera. I mean, you can make prints from anything, and, and it's per easier than ever to make prints. I'm getting prints off my new Epson R3000, but every day I look at them, I, I just can't believe the quality. Yeah, so I, it, I, it's absolutely. Um, no, I mean, I, I, th I still think printing is relevant, but I think for – the commercial use of photography or the public display of photography, that printing is going to become increasingly less relevant. Well, here's what I, I – I, you know what I'm reminded of? <laughs> Blade Runner. Yeah. You know – do you remember Blade Runner? I'm stuck on the clothes right now in my head. Thanks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, if you think about like all the – the projected imagery that people were interacting with and flying their spaceship cars through, etc. I think I think that's really pretty much where we're going, and I, I think that's a good thing. I mean, it's it's it, you know, immersive imagery is always very cool. That that's one of the things I've always loved about panoramic photography and time lapse photography, and, and for that matter, HDR to create something that people will spend more than a oh, that's a nice picture, click. You know, something that they sit there and they absorb the details and they look at the finesse. You know. Uh, it's, you know, you're taking a moment that you saw or a location that you hiked to or discovered, you know, and you're sharing that for others. It's really nice when people actually take the time to absorb it or, you know, get transported to that in the, ma the mind's eye. And I think these sorts of technologies are going to do that. I mean, I found myself spending a lot of time on those Lytro demos. And even though it was, and I don't want to say it's a gimmick, but the same sort of thing of like, oh, clicking and moving the focus around, I still found it interesting looking through the picture and what the choices were. You know, it's the same thing that is appealing to me about a good time lapse. It's just really attractive to be more immersed in the image and to get to go places that you haven't been. I mean, I can't wait to see. I, I hope they get these cameras all around the world and, you know, get people 
people playing with them because there's all sorts of places that could use more photographic documentation. Yep, I agree. Okay, Rich, let's uh, take a couple of questions we have here on the show. But before we do that, I do have to uh, take just a moment and thank some of our sponsors. Without Animoto, of course, we would not be here. Animoto is the best place that I can think of to show your pictures and slideshows, etc. You don't have to be any kind of wizard or even have any software. You just load your pictures up to this website and then they mix the music and the transitions, and it looks like it was something from MTV. You can click on the banner there at the photofocus.com homepage to get more information, or just go to photofocus.com. Also want to mention that any of the gear that we talk about today will probably eventually be for rent over at borrowlenses.com. They have everything just about known to man. They even have, like, the red camera, and they have... They have top-of-line video equipment. They have lenses and bodies for almost every brand. If they don't have it at borrowlenses.com, you probably don't need it. Another thing to think about with them is you can also borrow the gear that you're thinking of buying and check it out more thoroughly than you would be able to if you just picked it up from a store. And if you really like stuff, then you can go out and, and buy it, and you can just sort of get a test run. That's another reason that I like to use borrowlenses.com. Let's uh, talk about a couple of questions here. Are you familiar with the old program called iView, Rich? I've heard of it, iView but I've multimedia. never... iView Multimedia. Was that the one that was um, like a photo organizer that Microsoft had for a while, or am I missing they, this They too? were involved in it. I think it, it, I think it came out of a couple places. Anyway, uh, I got a question from uh, Carolyn Photography that says, what is iView? Who is it made by, and what do people love it so much? Um um, this is from Lafayette Hicks in Jackson, Mississippi, Carlin Photography. Well, basically, iView is the precursor to Aperture. It uh, is very much like Aperture, and Joe Shore worked on it. A little bit of tidbit there, uh, Rich. Well, that makes sense. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, well, I could definitely see that being – is it still being developed at this I point? I don't think so. I could be okay. wrong. Um, but it was very popular. I used to use it. Uh, it, it but it, with the in the advent um, – Lafayette Hicks wrote this question. In the advent of Lightroom and Aperture, I, I don't think it's that relevant anymore. Now, I'm sure I'm going to get email from all eight <laughs> of the remaining iView diehards. But, uh, well, I was going to say, I know people who still boot under OS 9 to get certain features from certain old apps, like some of those people doing you know, original VR who don't want to change tools. So uh, yeah. for many folks, if they get used to a tool and they love it, they will love it until they can no longer run it. And they'll go through great lengths rather than retrain themselves. So it was a solid program. I've, I've always heard good things, but I don't think it's for sale anymore. But someone will probably tell us we're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Got another question from Rob Palumbo. It's about shooting horizontal panos. Says, I'm interested in shooting horizontal scenery panoramics with my cameras in the vertical or portrait position. My question is two-part. Does the camera need to pivot on its focal plane or the lens's nodal point? And can you recommend a tripod for this kind of photography? We got the we got nodal point in there. You know, you yeah. got to say nodal point at least once a day. Nodal. <laughs> no, you want to take that one there, Rich? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this is this is something we cover extensively over at a uh, companion site over at Triple Exposure. Um, the, there's the official answer, and then there is the modern answer. So, so yes, officially, all of those things matter. Yet, software is so good that they don't really matter. So, you can shoot vertical, or you could shoot horizontal. I'm a big fan of shooting vertical just because it gives me more resolution to work with because then the taller part of the image is the height and you, you have to stitch more photos together, but you get more resolution, which is nice for printing or even multimedia use for zooming. Um, but beyond that, you know, the, the idea for those who are kind of curious why we're, we're laughing at the word nodal is that for a true panorama, People go through great lengths to make sure that the camera is pivoting exactly around the nodal point, which often involves offsetting it a bit from the tripod. So it's sort of spinning more on the base. And they'll have special plates and all of this gear for it. But the only special equipment I use, and, and this isn't even a, a dead set, is I use an L bracket just to make it easier to lock the camera in either horizontal or vertical position. Other than that, you know, most tripods will work. I shoot on a really right stuff. I know you use totally different stuff, Scott. I just like having degree markers on my panorama head. That way when I turn, I'm turning the same amount 
and it makes it easier, I can get the overlap I need without constantly having to bend down and look through the viewfinder, both because I'm old and it leads to things being um, you know, more likely knocked out of position. But that's just my approach. Photoshop does wonders with stitching together pictures. We got a bunch of tutorials posted over at 3exposure.com. Yeah, I, I think nodal points and all that kind of stuff's important if you do 3D work or if you're, you know, doing very high-end post work for movie houses and all that kind of stuff. But you know, considering the fact that we we can we've when we've had to we've handheld panos and they come out pretty darn good. Photoshop is just so good. Yeah, That's Photo Merge has gotten great. And I mean, and just for so people don't get scared, that same technology is in Photoshop Elements. So if 99 grow, bucks, right? Right. Yeah. So I see people go out and spend more than that just on Panorama software. <laughs> yeah. Just, just get Photoshop Elements. I mean, Adobe has this down. Where that nodal point really matters is if you're dealing with something super close in the foreground, like a railing or something like that. But if you're dealing with stuff, you know, at least you know, five, six feet away from the lens and you're not trying to show things, you know, intersecting, it's zero problem. And, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. And even technology like content aware fill from Photoshop can be used at once you try to stitch those together. If you've got gaps on like a 360 panel, right. but panorama photography is so much fun and it has gotten so easy and, and you nailed it there, Scott, I probably do at least a third of my panoramic images handheld. I just plant my feet about shoulder width apart, put my, uh, you know, the center of me facing where the middle of the pano is going to be because that's the primary focus area, and then just twist at the waist and, you know, twist back and take the rest. It works great. The other little trick that I discovered for super busy scenes that's awesome with Photoshop is shoot two pictures for each plate and wait a couple seconds between them. If you've got a really busy scene, um, we posted a tutorial on this. Photoshop's actually smart enough to avoid getting the same person in two spots or you know them getting cut off as they're walking through the frame. I shot a busy scene of um, Huntington Beach, California with you know, 500 people on the beach, and I only had to clone one person out of the scene because of a problem. It just blew my mind away. Yeah, that's a cool trick. All right, we're going to briefly mention two more sponsors and take a few more questions. I want to thank Smug Mug, professional photo sharing, for helping us with the show. If you want to sell your pictures online, they're a particularly good place to go do that. That's what they sort of specialize in. You can even get stuff printed right from there. The other thing they do, and I talk about it every time we do the show, but people still don't seem to get it, they are great at hosting video. They do not compress video. Everybody else does. But whatever you upload to Smug Mug, that's what they send down. And the video quality is stupendous, and their terms of service are the best I've seen. So check them out. There's a, a banner you can click on on the Photo Focus homepage. You want to go over there or just go to SmugMug.com. Com. And then lastly, I want to talk about ViewBug. If you have never been to this site, you really should go. V-I-E-W-B-U-G. Again, there's a banner on the homepage. They do the coolest photo contest. I mean, there's zillions of them. I've been having real fun just going and voting on pictures. Whenever I get a few spare minutes, I go vote on pictures. It's a lot of fun. Check out ViewBug.com. We appreciate their support of Photo Focus. All right, we have a question from Roderick Henry. And we get some basic questions, and I try to make sure we get one or two of these in once in a while because, you know, everybody starts someplace. Roderick wants to know, what's a neutral density filter? And why would someone use a neutral density filter? It's basically sunglasses for your camera. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it, the, uh, I mean, and there's, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, I'll, I'll, let me ta tackle one for shooting video, and then you take a still example. Uh, a lot of times when shooting video – you're trying, you know, on a DSLR you're, or on a point shoot, you're trying to get that shallower depth of field look that everyone loves, you know, a little bit of bokeh. Uh, and when you do that, you got the camera sensor open so much that so, so much light is getting in that it's really easy to overexpose the footage. And so you put one of those on or you get a variable ND filter that's you could tweak. And it's just basically acting like sunglasses for the camera. And it cuts down how much light is getting in, which is great when you're shooting in bright locations. Yeah, it's really nice if you want to do those kind of creamy, smoothy water shots, but it's daytime and you can't get a slow shutter speed because you got too much light. You just throw on a plus seven neutral density filter and away you go. Yeah, so that the motion streak type stuff with yeah, the, the yeah. smooth water. Yeah, it, it's just a great way. It, it gives you more flexibility <laughs> with shutter speed. Because it's just it's giving you that there. So you know, I, I think to as you progress as a photographer, you'll like having an ND filter. It's it's really helpful in those situations. But even if just basic stuff, if you're shooting in really bright conditions, 
uh, and you're not happy, you know, everything's looking too crisp or too staccato, you know, this can let you get some of that motion blur back in if you're going for that. Yeah, and for those of us that do shoot video on our DSLRs, you're kind it's of a critical. At, you're kind of trapped at three shutter speeds, 50, 60, or 125. And if you got too much light to uh, attain any of those, you got to throw that that becomes your exposure control. Absolutely. That's why I love the variable ND filters, although they're ridiculously expensive. Yes, I keep I keep almost buying one and then <laughs> My wife will remind me that we have something else that we need for the house. Yeah, I got the Sing, they're, they're not, I got the Sing, that bad. I got the look, Sing Ray Very ND and couldn't make my Porsche payment that month. So I mean, it was just you know, it's a lot of money, but it's cool once you've got one. And I try. I mean, I've found all kinds of cool ways to do it. I'll just go into any good old fashioned daylight scene and throw it on there just to see what happens. Well, I think that you bring up a good point there too, which is sometimes a new piece of equipment can be used in unexpected ways or it it lets you experiment. So in that case, by you being able to not be trapped by a shutter speed that works, you can experiment more and and get more done and have more options with aperture and and everything else, which is pretty cool. Right, right. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take a question from Dean Meslowski, who's from Michigan. Uh, an island in the Detroit River between the U.S. and the Canada. And uh, this is a question I think he's aimed pretty much at me because it has to do with big lenses. Uh, he has a Canon 7D with a 7200 lens monopod on a lens ring. And sometimes he thinks the junction between the camera body and the lens is stressed. He wants to know if there's any guidelines for moving around with a large lens uh, on the camera without a tripod. So here's the thing. With a 70 to 200 if it's the brand new 7200 top of line 28, that is a big heavy lens. And if you were to hold the camera by the body and swing it around a lot, I can see over time that that would stress the lens mount to the point where it might need to be tightened, adjusted, or repaired. I don't think it would permanently damage it. But if you start getting into three, four, five hundred millimeter lenses and do that, you're, you could even break that mount. So my recommendation is when you're using a long lens on a DSLR, simply get in the habit of grabbing the camera by the lens as opposed to by the camera body and always have the lens cradled in your hands. Now, most of these lenses have lens collars available for them. Now, the thing that I don't like about Canon is that many of their 70 to 200s don't come with the lens collar. They're cheap about it. You got to buy it separately. You don't even maybe know it's available. But if you have a 70 to 200 or anything bigger than that, there's a lens collar available for it. Go buy it or jury rig one. And then use that lens collar as the way you hold everything together. That'll put a lot less stress on the camera body and particularly the mount where the two connect. And why that's so crucial is that the electronics that work everything between the autofocus system and the meter and all that stuff that match that lens to the body talk to each other through that mount. If that gets screwed up, you're going to lose that. When I'm shooting video on a longer lens like that, and, and even sometimes stills, I find a monopod is great. I just get, I have like a little six stage carbon fiber one that weighs about a pound that I could throw in my camera bag. It collapses down to like the size of one of those mini umbrellas, but you extend it out and it's perfect. And so, you know, it, it'll just take all that weight out of your hands. You get smoother shots. You know, it's a nice compromise from having to lug a tripod. So, uh, I think you could really better support the camera and get more stable footage and, and better, cl- clearer shots without having a big piece of equipment to, to lug around. I, t- I totally agree. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely the way to go. Well, that's, uh, that's what we have time for today here on the PhotoFocus podcast. A couple of quick reminders. You can follow the PhotoFocus only feed on Twitter at PhotoFocus, or if you want all my stuff, it's at Scott Bourne, S-C-O-T-T-B-O-U-R-N-E on Twitter. We do publish the 5th, the 15th, the 25th of every month. We don't just do questions anymore, but you can still send them in to PhotoFocus at me.com. Come, and uh, we'd love to uh, hear from you in any event. Uh, Rich, when you're not uh, visiting us here at PhotoFocus, where can people find you? Sure. I maintain a personal blog at Richard Harrington Blog, and uh, they could check out my company at RedPixel, R-H-E-D-P-I-X-E-L.com, and I'm under RedPixel on most social media outlets as well, Google+, Twitter, things like that. Excellent. Excellent. And how about you, Scott? Anything else coming up in uh, – for you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm like a rash. You can Google me. I'm everywhere. But uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, 
one thing I'll just mention, if you are into car photography and cars, I do have my little car loves site, carloves.com. I do talk uh, photography there, but also cars in general, so you can check me out over there. Of course, I hang out with you at 3exposure.com, and then I'm on Twitter every day. It's going to So that's it. That's all the time we have for this episode of Photo Focus. We're going to leave you like we always do. Go out there and make pictures. Don't just take pictures. We'll see you in 10 days on the next Photo Focus. <laughs>